Go back to Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Huh. Blessed are they that do his commandments. These people that are out there and they'll say that the, the salvation always has been and always will be by faith alone. Where's faith at there? Hmm? Verse 14 there. Uh, Blessed are they that do his commandments. Uh, where's faith? And it doesn't say that they have eternal life, that they, they get it through the blood of Jesus and things like that. It doesn't say that. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Their eternal life comes from a tree, the tree of life. Hmm. Very interesting. Don't be fooled by these uh, faith alone people that try to say that salvation has always been by grace through faith. Salvation is by grace through faith right now. But uh, it's not in the uh, future, into eternity. And of course, it doesn't mean that, you know, Christians, when the rapture happens, that's boom, our time is done. God's focus goes from the church to the nation of Israel at that point in time. And he's still going to deal with the Gentiles and stuff as well. Um, that'll be there also in the time of Jacob's trouble. You read about that in Revelation chapter 7. There will be a great multitude that gets saved out of that time period. But the church age is going to end which is grace through faith. Then it goes to the time of Jacob's trouble, and you have the faith of Jesus and keeping commandments, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Then you go into the millennial kingdom. Nobody's living by faith then. Jesus is physically on the earth. There is no faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about. How can you have faith? I believe in Jesus by faith. Some other guy goes, well, I don't. He's right there. See him up on the throne? There's Jesus. How do, you, how do you have faith? <laughs> Weird. And in the time here, in, when you go into eternity, verse 14, you're doing His commandments. No faith at all. Again, they may enter in through the gates into the city. What's in the city? Jesus. They're seeing Him. You don't need to have faith. Verse 15. For without our dogs and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Six. God definitely has a system of numbers in the Bible. And Satan, of course, he perverts it in the occult, and they make numerology out of it. But God has a system of numbers. Six is the number of man. Hmm. Sinful man, there are six groups listed here. Let's define these. First you have dogs. What is a dog? Second Peter. Second Peter chapter twenty. Excuse me. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty. <sighs> chapter twenty in Second Peter. There's a lot of chapters apparently. <laughs> Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty through twenty-two. We'll get it right yet. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. There's a lot of people who have a knowledge. They know the right words to say. They've been through some kind of a service out there somewhere where it's they get all caught up in the emotions and come forward now if you want to be saved and bow your head and close your eyes and say, God, if you're... And they, they get caught up in the thing and they go... They do their little church thing for a while, then they go right back to the world again. They escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But they don't believe in the heart. They aren't coming to Him in that broken, contrite spirit saying, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. God, please help me fix this mess of a life up. They're not doing that. It's salvation in most of the church buildings out there is, is preached today as life enhancement. That's what it is. You have a God-sized God hole in your body and only Jesus can fill it and, and then everything will be good from then on and stuff. And we look at all of our little programs we have for your children and you know, the married couples program and the couples retreat and the Valentine's dinner and, the, and the, all this stuff. Social clubs. That's what church buildings are. But let's continue. Verse 21. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. What a terrible thing. I mean, the very nerve of God writing this through Peter and saying, yeah, explain this, that uh, these people that come, the men that come here and say, oh, I want to be saved and everything else, and then they go back to the world, they're a dog going back to their vomit. You ever have a dog and they do that? They go outside and they, they, uh, and they throw up and stuff, and then they go over and they sniff it and they start licking it again. You know, uh, you know <laughs> disgusting animal. That's what the Lord thinks of a professing Christian man that does his little church thing for a while and then goes right back to the world. Yeah. And you know, it used to be that you'd have uh, Christians, Christians, and they would come, these false converts, and they'd come into some church building someplace, way, way, way back, early 1900s, back into the 1800s, you know. Um, a lot of those meeting houses, they, they, you know, they called them churches and stuff, but they were more like a meeting house. And it'd be, you know, they'd come in there and stuff, and they'd, they'd make a profession of faith, and they'd kind of do their thing for a little bit, and then they'd get messed up and, you know, whatever. And it was the church building that, offended them a lot of times because the preaching was too hard back in the old days. And, uh, you know, I'm never going to be for church building, so don't say, oh, he's for them because you know, ones in the 1800s were good, you know. And No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is a lot of the things that they did were a lot better back then than stuff that goes on today. But what happened today is the difference between now and back in the early days of, you know, 1800s and 1900s, because see, before then, before about 1700, Christians didn't meet in church buildings. It was a very, very short little time where Christians were building meeting houses and then they kind of evolved into church buildings and then we have the abominations that we do today. So that's why I'm saying it's only, you know, back to the old days of Christians meeting in church buildings, it's not that far back in the history. But let's just go with this, okay? You go back then, they had standards and some guy comes in and he says, I'm sick and tired of this. And he goes back to his old vomit again. All right, back to the old wicked past life that he had and even goes into other things. But today, what we have is instead of them leading, leaving the church buildings, they're actually bringing their vomit into the buildings. You know, you get saved and you say, boy, I used to listen to ACDC and Metallica and, and Megadeth and all this other, you know, whatever. I'm showing my age here, you know, uh, 1980s you know, heavy metal and rock and roll bands. And, um, you know, I used to listen to that stuff. Ah, it's just so vexing. And now you have the people, these false converts, and they come and they have the knowledge, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they know the right things to say, but there's no heartfelt conviction there about sin. And they come and they say, um, instead of me leaving, having this knowledge, and then later leaving and going to the world, actually, no, I'm going to have this knowledge, and I'm going to bring the vile vomit of the world in and Christianize it. I would not step foot in pretty much any church building anymore. I mean, there's a few out there that are still trying to kind of cling to the old ways and whatever else. And I've been in those places and things and, you know, whatever. Uh, and you're claiming the things that aren't in Scripture, but I've talked plenty about that. But the whole point is the vast majority of these modern church buildings, um, <laughs> bad news. Uh, we were in... Uh, town down south of here yesterday, Millinocket is what it's called, and uh, they had this thing in the community park down there about they were given sleigh rides, free sleigh rides, and I thought, hey, that's be kind of neat, you know, we go on a free sleigh ride and things, and, and we get there, and it's like this blaring loud, I mean, huge big speakers, and, and like this blaring loud music, and we're just like, no, oh, you know, like, what is this thing and stuff, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure because there were some people there and stuff like this, and they were, and it was all like this modern CCM type of Christmas music, and it was just like, this is some kind of church putting this thing on. And I, you know, I was like, okay, we're not even going to go on a sleigh ride or whatever. It wasn't even a sleigh; it was a wagon with wheels on it, you know, but nice big draft horses and stuff like that. But I was just like, okay, this is like, you know, really, really offensive. I mean, there are stories, news stories of people in the towns calling police and saying, hey, could you please come and have this church building turn their music down? It's really offensive. We had to do the same thing with these charismatic, 
charismatic Catholics across the street, right across here, you know. What are they doing? Well, the dog has turned to his own vomit again. And now they're bringing the vomit into the home, into their church building. It's really something. But not in heaven, without our dogs. What's the next group? Sorcerers. Turn to Acts chapter 9, or excuse me, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 is where we're going to go to. And again, you know, you say, why are we going over these things, Brian? Well, very simple. Because the Lord is showing us things in eternity. The Lord is saying, okay, this is, you know, His preferences, His things that He says, this is what I want, this is what I'm preparing for you for eternity. Um, then you can say, you know what, if the Lord's going to do these things in eternity, then maybe I ought to get Him and, and understand these things and have them in my life right now. The Lord separates the nations. Segregation. Preserving the people and their, and their culture and identity and things like that. Well, then maybe I ought to believe that is correct for now in spite of the fact that it's very unpopular. See what I mean? Um, the Lord's going to have beautiful music. Not the world's music. Not this vile garbage that's out there. This vomit that's out there of the world. Well, then maybe I shouldn't put that stuff in my life and try to call it Christian. Here's another one. Sorcerers. What is a sorcerer? Acts chapter 8, verse 9. I'm going to read down to verse 25. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery. What is sorcery? Check this out. This is very important. And bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Hmm. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Did you ever hear these guys say, He's a man of God. This man, don't you speak against the man of God. I still get that Hiles called us and stuff like this, and they're going, Yo, You're just jealous of Jack Hiles. Brother Hiles was a great man of God. Yeah, he's preaching his sermons and stuff, and he's got his wife here, and Jenny Nishik, his deacon's wife over here, and he's fornicating with her while married to her. And you watch his sermons, and you can just feel that that professional oration, the speeches, and and doing all these big loud voices and bringing it down to the way that he speaks. And God wants you, Christian. And all oh, this, this little talk that these guys do. What is it? Sorcery. Bewitchment. Mind control. They brainwash their followers. Modulation of the voice. It's a great way to do it. Verse 11. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And look at this. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He made a profession of faith. Well, then I guess he's a Christian, according to some of the brethren. Keep reading. Verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only that only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Uh, would you do that as a saved man? Nope. I've heard some of the brethren, they'll try to say, oh yeah, I think Simon was a saved man. He's just a little bit off or whatever. Huh? I want that power. I want to be able to do that. Why? Because he still wants to bewitch the people. He still wants that sorcery that he can hold over people. And he's thinking, man, if I could do those tricks, you know, up there in verse 13, wondered beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He's watching it. Wow, I got to learn to do this thing. Oh man, He's not going to give out his money unless he thinks that he can make it back. Yeah. Why do you use sorcery and bewitchment over people? 
to get into their wallet. I mean, let's just be real. That's what it's all about. Look what Peter says, verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Somebody who has a heart that's not right in the sight of God is a lost person. Don't even tell me the guy was saved. Verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come, on, uh, come upon me. Uh, wait a second there. Verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Peter says, you need to pray about this, buddy. You need to repent of this thy wickedness. You're not right in the sight of God. You better pray to God. And what does he say? Then answered Simon and said, Pray you to the Lord for me. Why doesn't he want to pray to the Lord? Because Peter nailed him up in verse 23. I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He was right. He was better. He lost control of the people. And he's there going, Okay, these guys can do a lot better tricks than I can. I wonder if I can learn how to do this. Huh. Oh, that's a good one. I wonder if I can offer money. Oh, here's some money. And they go, my money perish with thee. He is in the gall of bitterness. He wants to get control of those people again. And in the bond of iniquity, he's bound in his sin. Sorcerers. But that's okay. You see, because this is the first century, Simon the sorcerer, nobody does it anymore. Nobody uses mind control to get a hold of people and things like that. Nobody will modulate their voice and do certain preaching things and use their big church building and all that other stuff. And nobody does that anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> sarcasm, people. There's sarcasm, you know. I get some of these people that don't quite get my sarcasm sometimes and they go, Well, there's people, do Don't you? Are you dumb? You know, Brian? Or you, you don't know that? I'm, like, I'm joking. It's a joke. It's <laughs> what about whoremongers? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. What is a whoremonger? Well, somebody that mongers whores, you know. They go after whores, in other words. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. But fornication, in all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. In other words, you shouldn't be talking about it, and you certainly should not be doing it and getting a reputation for doing it. Verse 4, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. It doesn't mean that you can't have a sense of humor. It just means don't just be a fool all your life. Okay, Don't just make word games and funny little jokes about everything it's said. You know, there's times that you need to be serious. For this ye know, verse 5, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. No whoremonger is going to get in. Okay? And you say, what is a, you know, give me a good example of a whoremonger today. Well, a whoremonger, um, I would say it's people that are, are basically living together without any kind of a marriage. Uh, they're just, you know, fornication partners, fornication friends, you know, and they just go from one partner to the next and one partner to the next and one partner. That's a whoremonger. You don't have to be, you know, if you're going after whores, it doesn't mean you have to be paying them each time. Uh, there, there are different ways to be a whore as a woman, okay? Um, you can sell your body for a lot, of different, a lot of different ways and things like that. And there's a lot of people that use, you know, each other. Uh, men use a, a women and, and women nowadays, you know, it used to be women were ladies back in the past, you know, and they dress like ladies and act like ladies. 
but now it's cool and trendy for women to act like men, dress like men, look like men, whatever. And uh, they use men just as much as men use women. Whoremongering, you see? That's what's going on there. Let's go to murderers next. Of course, you actually have murderers of going out and killing people that they don't like or whatever else. They want to steal their money or, or whatever. They'll murder them. But there's another type of murderer. First John chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Let's read that. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Um, when you're truly saved, you're not going to hate your brother or sister in Christ. And you say, well, you know, you've attacked people and stuff like this. Yeah, because I love them. I, repu I reprove and rebuke and exhort and things like that. I mean, think about that. What is reproving and rebuking? I see somebody is wrong in, in sin. I say, well, that guy's, you know heading towards being a papist or he's this or he's that you know there's some people i've rebuked and i'm i'm not sure either way i'm like i don't know are they saved are they lost i don't know are they just teaching false doctrine because they've not learned the bible well enough or i don't know about some people um i don't know but i'm going to reprove them and rebuke them why because i love them a reprove or rebuke is does not mean this little wishy-washy just uh you know now there's there's a certain person that I have some some disagreements with. That's not love, okay? That's not a reprove or a rebuke, right? That's you just being cowardly to come out and speak the truth in a blunt, bold manner, okay? True and faithful are sayings. When I see somebody in sin and when I see somebody messing around, uh, my flesh says, take it easy on them. Um, just... Don't say anything because you're going to lose their friendship or whatever else and things like this. That's not right. If I know the book says something and they're doing things wrong, I need to say something about that. I have to say something. They're, they're messed up. And I can't tell you how many times I've lost friendships because I've done that. And I try to be gentle sometimes, but other times it's just like, okay, here we go. Boom, and out it comes. Why? Because I love them. If I see them messing around in some kind of sin that's going to ruin their lives, and we're talking about that here in the future, or in a future study, maybe later today, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it in, but uh, I'm going to be talking about how Satan uses sexual sin to destroy Christians. I have seen that thing over and over and over and over again, and I've tried to warn people. I see them heading in that direction. I'm just like, you need to stop. I mean, I had a situation years ago where a brother, which was a good friend of mine, we're in our house church and he's preaching this sermon and I'm just like, okay, I know what he's doing here. This is a, he's got some perversion problems. I stopped him preaching right in the middle of his sermon. Bam. I said, okay, brother, come with me and you that's preaching, you come with me as well. And we went outside and I rebuked him and I said, you are not right in what you're doing, you know? And he later, you know, did the same thing. He stood up and rebuked me and things, waited till I was done preaching and he rebuked me and attacked me, and, and uh, he ended up leaving our fellowship. And uh, a while later, a couple months later, he gets he calls me on the phone, and he said, I was wrong to do what I did. You were right but with what you did, but I was wrong. I did it out of anger, and I did it to get back at you and whatever. And he said, I need to ask your forgiveness. I'm not right with God right now. I need to ask your forgiveness. Um, Brian McClurg, of uh, I recommended his channel for a long time. He was the one that introduced me to local church Bible publishers. And, you know, he's uh, church Bible publishers, I guess, now. He, he talks about that and stuff. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But, you know, he came out with a video. Brother sent it to me, and he said, Brian's, you know, saying, hey, I want to restore that fellowship and stuff, and I want to please forgive me for the videos I've made against you. Forgiven. Done. Finished. Doesn't mean we have to be best buddies and just, you know, perfectly agree on everything no it doesn't mean that but he was man enough to come along and say sorry i went too far praise the lord okay if i've gone too far in some of the you know rebuking some of the brethren and things then i apologize for that but uh let's get back to the study here you know we are supposed to love the brethren um continuing here in first john chapter three 
verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, uh, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. Love for the brethren. If you don't, you know, you can murder somebody, spiritually speaking. I've seen that thing. So, but let's continue. Idolaters. Another thing. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1. Let's start there. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's what we're doing today. Read in Revelation chapter 22. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is, your, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, and for the image of him that created him. Change life. I don't know why people get upset about the thing of preaching a changed life. I just, I don't understand that, you know. <clears throat> but you got to watch out for idolatry. Because you can certainly start to fall into idolatry when it comes to the things of this world. And covetousness is going to cause you to make some idols. All right. Finally, we have there the, the other one there in Revelation chapter 22. You have whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now look at this. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do we see lies out there in the world today? All these people? Well, science has proved that there is no God. Science has proved that evolution is true and that, you know, we're, we, we're here by an accident. Actually, not an accident. It was actually space aliens that seeded us here. You know, I mean, there's people that believe that. I mean, it's, it's insanity. Um, and uh, you get people and they say, actually, I, was, I, I might be a man, but I'm actually a woman. You know, I saw some guy, you know, a while back and... and uh, white guy and he was going around saying that actually uh, he, he's, he's actually Asian. He's a Chinese woman or something like this. It's called mental illness. Okay, mental illness. All right. But uh, you see people and they don't want the truth. They want strong delusion. And so God says, oh, okay, I'm going to give you that. Scary thing. Back to Revelation chapter 22. And again, they want it here on earth. And they're going to have it here on earth no matter what, even if it costs them their soul. Again, I saw there was some sodomite pervert uh, down in some, some university student, and he was like transgender or whatever else and stuff. And, and, uh, and, you know, he was 
walking around. He had a knife, you know, and stuff. And the police are, you know, pistols rolling at him. And, you know, they're saying, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. And he's going, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. And finally, they listened, gave him his request. Bam. Dead. That was happened months ago and stuff, but yeah. But he's going to be different in eternity, right? Let him that is filthy be filthy still. But let's continue. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto the, you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And of course, if you know about this, you know, the bright and morning star thing, the controversy with the NIV. Um, okay. But if you don't know about this, let me just explain it. The New International Version in Isaiah 14, verse 12 the King James Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Okay? And it's Lucifer. It's talking about the devil. The NIV took the name Lucifer out, and they say bright and morning star. And if you want to get into the Hebrew and things like that, the word kokab is the Hebrew word for star, and it doesn't appear in verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 14. Um, so the NIV, oh, well, it was we did a better translation than the King James Lucifer. No, they didn't. They had no basis, no manuscript basis at all for putting the word star in there. Interesting. The uh, Jesus of the NIV is identified back in Isaiah 14, 12 as being fallen from heaven. Hmm. Verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that is uh, him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst. Come, the water of life, remember? And whosoever will, let him take of the water, take the water of life freely. Jesus is stretching out his hand. Come. Let me show you about that. Isaiah chapter 9. Get back to the Old Testament. One of the most amazing passages of Scripture. Just to show, because you, know, you hear this thing, people, why would a loving God send people to hell? And why would a loving God this? And why would a loving God that? I wouldn't do it, so why would God do it? If you knew everything about man that God knows, uh, you'd be a lot crueler than he is. Believe you me. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, Neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Isn't that amazing? All the stuff that's happening in this country right now, the Lord just smiting people and saying, turn, turn, stop doing what you're doing. Repent, turn back to me. No. <laughs> oh, our houses are burning and, uh, and we have flooding and we have this happening and all this bad stuff, you know, you know and everything and promise of war coming and disease and, and, you know, all this stuff. But I don't want to turn to the Lord. Incredible. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Preachers like, you know, kind of like preachers today teaching lies. Absolutely. Verse 16, For the leaders of this people call them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Very true for today. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. <laughs> it's just like, okay, it's the things that happened before, you know, back in the Old Testament are written for our learning, okay, in the New Testament. That's why it's important as a Christian not just to study the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. You're going to see so many things that happened back there in the Old Testament happen today as well. But now look at this. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Whosoever will. You want to be saved? He's not turning his anger away from heaven, from earth, or well, from America, I was going to say. You know, the Lord's not turning his anger away from this country. He's going to keep on whipping this country and, and the world too, by the way, not just America. The Lord's going to keep on doing things and, and allowing evil men 
and seducers to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The geoengineering and the GMO crops and all this other bad stuff, it's part of God's judgment. Absolutely. His anger is still there. He's not going to eventually go, oh, nuts. I, I was trying to punish people, but they're not listening. Oh, you know, I, I guess I'll quit. I'll just let them have their way. And he goes over in the corner and pouts and sucks his stomach. Uh-uh, no. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you a spanking. No? Okay. Harder. No? Okay. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Ending in the time of Jacob's trouble where the Lord has to supernaturally shorten the days so that some flesh could be saved. But in spite of all that, in spite of his judgment and anger and everything else, he still offers salvation. His hand is stretched out still. Still. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, come. You want it? You want the water of life? You want it? It's free. Do you want it? Whosoever will, let him come. You say, but uh, you, know, you don't understand. I've done some really vile things. The Bible says come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah, but you don't understand. I, I was in the transgender movement and I've gone through this change of stuff like this and thing. And I don't know if there's people, you know, I, I've, I've seen some people say, well, they, they got out of it and whatever else. I don't know. I mean, it's really dangerous when you get into that level um, where you're changing how God made you. That's real, real dangerous stuff. I don't recommend you mess with that. Oh, very, very serious. But whatever you've done, hey, come to the Lord. His hand is stretched out still. You lose your home through fire, you lose your home through flooding, you lose your home through war, or you whatever else, lose family members or, or whatever, disease, famine, whatever it is. His hand is there. Whosoever will, let him come. Nobody can out, out there can say God is mer uh, merciless and vengeful and hateful and whatever. He's offering salvation. God has a right to judge his creation. He created it. He makes the rules. He's going to say, i got to punish this. This is wickedness. I need to stop this. But in spite of all that, he still is reaching out his hand saying, Come on. Come on. Come on. And if you slap his hand away and say, I don't want your salvation. I don't want anything to do with your Bible. I don't want you telling me what to do. Then when his judgment and wrath falls upon you, you're going to have no excuse when you stand before him. Verses 18 and 19, Revelation chapter 22. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Go back to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. It says here, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Hmm. True and faithful are his sayings. Do you believe that? Or are you... Uh, Described here in the next two verses. Verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You know, nobody out there that's saved is ever going to correct this book until they've sat under the uh, <clears throat> ministry of some scholar that starts to correct the book. Well, actually, the Greek word here, if you look at the tense of the Greek, it says, hmm? you know what, there's a lot of Catholics out there that try to say that they want to follow the Apostle Peter. Peter was the first pope and all this other stuff, and yet they sit under the pope today, and the pope says, I think we need to change the Lord's Prayer. Why? It's very difficult. Uh, in other words, it's uh, 
some things are hard to be understood. Mm -hmm. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. That's the Pope. Talk about an unstable man. He's con contradicted the catechism. He contradicts Catholic teaching all the time. He's unstable. And he rests it. He changes it. We need to change the scriptures. And what's it lead to? Under their own destruction. The man is headed for destruction. And if you're a Catholic and you say, well, I guess it's okay because the Holy Father does it. Uh, you're wrong. You have no right to change the scriptures. And if you do, you're heading towards uh, some real bad things happening to you. But let's finish up here. Revelation chapter 22, verses 20 and 21. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Jesus is coming quickly. And, uh, you know, it doesn't seem quick to us because we're here in the earth and we're thinking, man, it's you know, been almost 2,000 years. Not in heaven. And uh, where's John writing this from? In heaven. So he's up there. He's out of our time and things like that. He was caught up to heaven. He's seeing it and he's going, well, that was short. You know, the Lord goes up in Acts chapter 1. But he's only up here, not even two days. Comes back down, takes care of the whole matter. How close are we? I don't know. It could be. It could still be a few years. I don't know. You know, until this whole thing happens, I have no idea. But it's coming quickly. It's coming. And that time is going to happen in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. And then you're done. You're finished. You're going into the time period where things change. And you're probably going to get beheaded. It's going to be bad. Might as well get saved right now, you know. Might be a smart move. Let the Lord uh, come into your life and start shining that light that comes from this book and start telling you what you need to clean up. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for such precious promises. Uh, things that we can look forward to that are just, we can't even fathom it right now in, in this life. Uh, but Lord, I know that there's a lot of people out there that are lost and the vast majority of people are not going to be going up at the rapture. They're going to be staying down. And uh, we all have lost relatives and, and co-workers and friends and whatever else. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give all of us that, that holy desire to see people get saved and that you would give us boldness in our witnessing to people and, and in our lives, Lord, and, and that... Uh, you would shine the light of truth upon each of our lives as Christians and, and show us what needs to go. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that you would convict those out there that are making excuses for things that they have not get, gotten rid of in their life. And um, time is short, Lord. And whatever we have to give up in this life is going to be nothing compared to what we get in eternity in return. And I just pray, Lord, that you would convict the Christians out there that are in sin, that are doing something wrong, Lord, uh, in their life. They know what it is, Lord. It's between you and them. Help them to get it cleaned up before that time when they go up to be with you and have to face you face to face. I just pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would be mightily upon the people out there that are listening to this right now. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there it is. The end of Revelation chapter 22. Very much enjoyed these studies. Uh, been a real challenge to go through this thing. And, and uh, I know a lot of you have written and said that you're really liking these Revelation studies. And uh, where do we go from here? Not sure. I have a lot of uh, different subjects I need to talk about. And uh, some, you know, back way back when I first got into ministry, the Lord would give me a lot of um, topical type of, you know, uh, sermons to preach and things like that, you know, um, laughter in the life of a Christian or, or, you know, comfort for grieving Christians, things like that. And uh, that's probably what I'm going to be doing a lot of. Um, maybe some question and answer type of sessions in the future. Um, book reviews, Bible reviews, uh, whatever else. 
I'm going to try to get outdoors somewhat, you know, throughout the winter. Um, but camera equipment, most camera equipment doesn't do very good in extreme cold, so we'll see. Um, got a new camera not long ago because our cameras are very, very old, and uh, it's a you know smaller camera and things like that, not top of the line or anything, but it's it's better than what I've had in the past, and so trying to learn that thing and it's kind of uh, it's got a lot of new features on it that I'm not familiar with but uh, so the ministry continues to move forward and um, I thank all of you for the challenging comments that I get on the videos and and uh, just the fellowship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ so I think that's going to be it um, thank you very much for watching and uh, please do keep us in your prayers and I thank you to all that support this ministry. And i um, not sure what the next study is going to be, but we will see you in that next study. Thank you for watching.